This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale Live demo at www.rationale-online.com. This is a Grilled podcast. Um, just so you know, there may be a few right words. So, Mum, stop listening. Um, but all you guys uh, carry on listening because it is fun. But there may be a few swear words because we're chefs at the end of the day and we like swearing. Welcome to Grilled. I want to eat under roast whenever I want to eat under roast, not when you want me to eat it. I just remember Brad's smell of his beard. You just had a biggest, fluffiest beard, and I was like, God, he smells so good. <laughs> I don't know why, it's weird. Sometimes you put smell or something to it, and I just remember that, of course, a bit bizarre. Why are you in your chef's white cellar? Are you working? I'm cooking burgers. <laughs> oh, burgers. <laughs> I hope they're not McDonald's. And I just lash it all over the hot toast as it melts and quickly match it up, crunchy, crunchy, munchy. Dying to get like a piece of your culinary penis in or around their mouth. Welcome to Grilled, a podcast by The Stuff Canteen. I'm Cara, editor of The Stuff Canteen, and this is the fourth episode with my new co-host, uh, Aaron Mollis, former head chef at The Hand of Flowers and now owner of recruitment company, Tasty. Aaron. How are you hey, this episode? I'm, I'm very good, thank you. Yeah, very, very good. Excited for this one. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> are you strapped in? <laughs> I'm fully strapped in, yeah. Right, well, introduce your guests and why you wanted them on the podcast. Um, so this guy has been someone that I've, that I've admired in the industry for many, many, many years. Um, he's a chef patron of... Purnell's restaurant, the Prince of Birmingham himself, Glyn Purnell. By all means, I mean, there's no need to bow or anything like that will curtsy, but you may kiss the hands. <laughs> <laughs> Glyn Purnell, welcome to Grills. Um, how are you? Good, actually. I'm a little bit warm. Uh, obviously, the, 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 the bonus of being on this Grills chat is that you get a free staff canteen sort of shirts. Um, I don't feel there's much natural fibres in it, so I am quite hot, to be fair. <laughs> I feel the weeds running down my back, Aaron, as the conversation <laughs> continues. And I've got a slight pink blush colour to me. But other than that, it's great to be on here. And again, you know, that the respect and the, and the stuff bounces straight back at you. You, you, you know, you've been phenomenal in the industry and taking the next step that you have is, is, is inspiration to, to lots of chefs out there. So, yeah. Glenn, how do you know each other? I've, I've asked all of Aaron's guests this. So when was, did you first meet each other and how has that relationship developed where we, were, where we are now? Uh, I think, uh, I mean, there was a stage of, of, um, of our careers where we were very much a lot. It was a rock and roll period for, for, for us. Um, <laughs> and we, we socialised quite a lot. Um, I, I didn't. My children. I didn't really have children then, and it was like it was. We were going out quite a lot. We were meeting up with Tom, Sat, Claude, and we were sort of going to places, and we were we were really sort of socialising. And it was that sort of golden generation of the rock and roll era of of of, of British cookery. And that's when I met Aaron. He, he was like working hard, and he was he was a major uh, force at the, the hands. And you know, I met I met I met Aaron, and then also obviously I, I met Luke. And I'm not I'm not hundred percent sure, but it may have been in the toilets. <laughs> I remember I think oh, I remember uh, yeah uh, you know you don't know whether to take someone's hand because you know what the last thing they've shook that that was that sort of uh, meeting I think uh, yeah I, I'm surprised everyone is actually still alive for yeah. that period like they were obviously people like myself Luke um you know, that we were not the innocent bystanders. Uh, they grabbed us by the scruff of the neck and say, right, you drink this and you drink this now. Um, yeah. But, but just just to be a part of that and looking, you no, know, look, you, you kind of looked at, you did look up to these guys like Glenn, Sat, Daniel, Claude, Tom, because they were, you know, they are, they were and still are like cooking gods, but also like they worked hard, but Jesus Christ, did they play hard? Like that, that yeah. was full on. That was that was an incredible like period of time. I'm yeah, fascinated. I, think, I mean, obviously not to dwell on the, the rock and roll years as in that so much because obviously it was great because I think the culinary scene was that was a massive turning point, and you know we were sort of really proud to be British chefs, 
although we took massive influence from, um, you know, the French cuisine, where I was sort of trained, uh, Tom, I mean, obviously Claude, uh, I mean, I worked with Claude and that sort of thing. But, but we, we sort of almost started to create our own style and individuality about uh, of what British cookery has now become. And, and we were sort of the nucleus of that. But I think the, the, the fact that we hung out together so much inspired us all individually by actually sharing and being shoulder to shoulder with each other, which helped develop the restaurants that we've got now. And, and I feel the, the individuality of what we did as, 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 then as a secondary, as creative people like you, like, you, like yourself, Aaron, like, um, like John at Sats and like and Luke here. And, and, and you know, that, that has been a driving force. But I mean, the times we spent together were fantastic on, on, on a professional level, but, but as, as friends and as, as people that were in the industry was, was brilliant. And the golden years for me, I absolutely loved it. When you get picked up, off uh, Marlow High Street by Chris Evans. That's when you know you've had a good night out. <laughs> that was the That's first. The that was the first. That that was that was a Sunday. That was the first day I ever worked at the Hand and Flowers. Really? Yeah. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> and it was such a great night. Um, I went for a ball two with Heston. Um, and it was just. <laughs> Did I can't Didn't someone <laughs> fall out the car as he was driving up Marlow High Street? Or someone was hanging out the car? Was that you? Yeah, it was me, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> like you said, I mean, how, how, how did we survive that? I mean, we worked hard. I mean, we, we, you know, we're all sort of owners of our restaurants and stuff, but not just owners that sat at the bar and counted the money. Chef patrons, chef owners, chefs that, you know, that, okay, we had uh, a little bit of media presence, but the most important thing about what we did was run restaurants how we wanted them to run. Uh, and then on the back of that, we joined each other's company and, and, and I, f I feel that had a massive part of the development of the culinary scene in the country, I do. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm looking forward to picking through some more of these stories. <laughs> it sounds like it's going to be good fun. <laughs> um, so we have been playing a little game, uh, Glenn, with Aaron, and I'm sure he's looking forward to this because yeah. I know that he's struggling to think of things now that we're on the, the fourth podcast. But... Um, yeah. So two two truths and a lie. Aaron, you go you. first. All right, okay. Uh, so number one, <clears throat> my food hell is anything savoury, hot, rich, and creamy. That doesn't sound too good, does it? Um, Not really. <laughs> <laughs> the last um, in 1989. So number two in 1989, um, I was on Jim will fix it, and Jim will, Jimmy Savile fixed it for me to meet my uh, hero at the time, Liverpool striker Ian Rush. And number okay. three, the last time that I got asked for ID to prove I was over the age of 18 was when I was 33 years old. You can ask any questions you want, Glenn, as well. Okay, well, 1989, uh, so what, you four, you're nearly 40 now. So uh, Ian Rush was... Yes, he was probably still playing. Um, but you going on Jimmy Savile? I, 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 I'm going to sort of half count that one out. I mean, that's that's quite um, that's quite a thing to to have met Jimmy Savile, to be honest with you, and uh, basically came away safe. <laughs> 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 I'd say, say that's probably a lie. I reckon, <laughs> uh, and <laughs> because I'm sure you'd have been interviewed at some stage. Um, I say. <laughs> Do you, I mean, I mean, if you have got the badge, I mean, fair enough. But um, and I think you not to enjoy anything savoury. I think that you know, as a chef and someone with a great palate, I think, I think, I think that's probably obviously a lie. So I'm going to go. I'm a little bit gone ho. I'm going to go for the last one. ID at 32 because you have got quite um, quite a young looking face, which is obviously a bonus being a chef. So I'm going to go with number three. As bit. He's got it around the wrong way, because he's going oh, with... hang on. The lie is the Jimmy Savile one. All oh, right, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Um, <laughs> <I've>, yeah. <laughs> you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm truly thankful that that didn't happen as well, yes. to be honest. <laughs> so am I. I am. So am I. <laughs> I mean, to meet Ian Rush would have been fantastic, you know what I mean? But, uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Did you ever, so, did you ever so, go to, to Jimmy Savile? Did you ever do that as a kid? No, no I, didn't, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't learn <laughs> to write till I was 26. <laughs> I, I just knew he was a wrong one. So I didn't write that He spots a wrong one. <laughs> he can spot a wrong one from a mile. Mile away. 
the wrong one straight away. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I didn't watch him. Do you know what? I did watch it, but I, I didn't like him. No. Okay, right. So the first one is <clears throat> I had a full snog, yeah, with Pierre Gagne. The second one, I was in the English team for the ping pong championships. And the third one, <laughs> I love the way you stared at me. <laughs> the look into your eyes. Yeah. Um, and then the third, let me think. And the third one is that I had lunch with Barbara Windsor. Okay. Aaron, what are you thinking? Right. I know for a fact the first one, the Pierre Gagné one, that's, that's, he's telling the truth there. That's the mm. truth. Because I looked through your book uh, yesterday and, oh. and, and, and you, had a, you had a little kiss and cuddle with Pierre Gagné after the um, GBM. So I know that's, I know that's true. See, I've been doing okay. my research. I've been doing my research. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, ping pong. Not sure about the ping pong. I'm not sure about it. But what year? Well, yeah. So it was probably. Uh, I think it was 1988. So I left school in 1990. So 98, nine, uh, no, 89, 88, 89. Sorry. Yeah, I left school in 90. I'm going to say ping pong is the lie. I think you had lunch with Barbara Windsor. I'm going to say ping pong's a lie. You're correct. Ping pong is a lie. Get um, I, uh, yeah, so uh, I had, um, so when we did the Great Wish Menu, <clears throat> Pierre Gagné is one of, one of my heroes, um, absolute character and a phenomenal chef. And uh, we went, he, he, as we went to, as he gave me the kiss here, the side, both of us having beards, there was a slight Velcro situation and we both got ex extraordinarily large noses and they sort of clashed a little bit. And I think we went full lips on. <laughs> but uh, I think champagne and a little bit of over enthusiasm um, sort of really rolled that on, to be honest with that. <laughs> one, of my, one, of the, one of the nicest persons that I, people I've kissed. I mean, that's not saying that most Brummie girls are hairy. I'm just saying <laughs> it's the I've ever had. And, and in regards to Barbara Windsor, I mean, I grew up um, loving uh, Carry On films uh, and Sid James, Barbara Windsor, all those sort of people. I absolutely love the slapstick comedy and all the rest of it. And I got an opportunity to, um, Barbara Winston's husband um, couldn't make it to the Great Rich Menu um, street, street meal, I think which Tom cooked on. And they said to me, Glenn, we've got a really important job for you. You've got to um, escort Barbara for the whole day, look after her. I sat, we had, we had lunch together and we even, I even got her to go into this pub. She went behind the, behind the bar and I went, come on, Barbara, come on, Barbara, come on, Barbara. Oh, and she slammed it down and she went, get out of my pub! <laughs> so <laughs> it was one of the best lunches I've ever had. We spoke, we talked about Arsenal football. We talked about her, one of her, her first husband, I think, was a chef. Uh, and she loved the food. And, and she spoke about her, her husband, uh, her recent husband, how much he loved food. And we did him a little doggy bag for him to take home and... We said, I had a phenomenal day with it, and it was uh, just a really special time. And two of the two great memories I've got there, which I've put into the mix, which I, I felt I was put on the spot a little bit, but I dealt with it. Both were from the Great Beach menu, and it just shows you what a fantastic sort of uh, program it is and, and how many amazing people you can get to meet in the kitchen and at the kitchen. So, yeah, yeah. them are two. Good, great stories, both of them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, before we move on to some other topics, um, I just want to talk about stuff that's in the news at the minute. And Glenn, obviously, you announced a, a new project uh, on Instagram. Um, can you tell us a bit more about it? Yeah, so um, the Bistro shut uh, last January, um, and that was basically because um, it comes to the end of its lease. We were negotiating to reopen, and obviously, we were just we were experiencing the second lockdown, so that was a case of you know, I had to rehouse staff. Uh, so then we, we I, met, I met a guy uh, called Luke Fry, who's a, an entrepreneur from, from sort of South Warwickshire. And he, he's bought a pub called the Butcher Social. And we got together and we decided that we're going to sort of turn it into this sort of uh, this eating sort of destination just on the Henley High Street. It's going to be called The Mount by Glen Fennell. Um, most of the staff that are going there have worked for me for a long time. So my general manager, Pete Casson's there and the head chef will be Phil Stegg. 
uh, Stegall, who is he was in the, he's in the kitchen as one of my sous chefs. So really exciting. Uh, it's my first venture outside the city centre. So um, I'm not nervous about it, but it's like, you know, I'm used to working in the city centre and you know the footfall, you know the style of clientele that you get. So it's going to be something new and, and interesting, yeah. And obviously the past uh, two years have been bloody tough for the hospitality industry. Is it nice to have that kind of, that this is what's happening in the future, being able to look ahead? Because obviously it has been a really like tough time. Most definitely. And I, and I think I've always been a half, uh, full kind of, uh, glass kind of guy so I always look at the, the massive positives of, of any situation and being a being a chef chef patron and all the years that I've opened you have to be resilient in the industry and I think you know I've got some great people uh, working here and obviously at the bistro previously that I think that it's it's, it's my responsibility to to house them in jobs because they want to still work for me and give them a bit of, you know, a bit of uh, responsibility and, and to move forward. So I think it's great that, you know, in a situation that the Pernals is thriving and that we're in a position that we can open somewhere else and really exciting. And I'm hoping that after this variance sort of, we're coming sort of out the back of it, I think it'd be, it's going to be great, um, a great year, I think, 2022. Yeah. What's, the, um, what's, the, what's the food style going to kind of be? Obviously with, with Pernals, it's very, you know, if, if you put... And this is the same across, like we were, at, like you were explaining before, with um, you know the likes of yourself, Claude, Daniel, Sat, Tom. Like if you put a dish from Pernell's in front of you in a in a you're in a in a room, you know, in a completely blank room, you just put let's put the monkfish curry in front of someone yeah. in the industry. They they know that's Glyn Pernell's dish. So is it um, is the mount going to have your you know your personality all over it again, or is it going to be something that's more you know? pub driven or yeah yeah i think um i think it's definitely going to be pub driven because you know this building is over 200 years old it's a pub uh, it needs to keep that and obviously taking inspiration from your old your old boss as well as what he's done for the pub industry and as well as the, uh, the hospitality industry i think to, to to focus on good solid pub food but to put sort of a little bit of a i hate saying the word the little twist on it or the little sort of the the DNA of what we do at Pernal. So there may be a form of like a like a fish curry or something that will certainly be classics on there, you know, like a cottage pie, but done in the, the, the style of what we would do something here. So it'll be recognisable, but also it will be have that familiar sort of look of what a, a pub is because I think you take over, and I, I suppose you could ask Tom and, and, and other guys that have taken pubs on a, on a high street that's been around for a while, is that you don't want to alienate the local people. So it's a case of us trying to keep the locals happy. You've got a big tourism sort of uh, span because you've got Stratford uh, down the road and Henley Medieval Market Town is quite a popular tourist destination. And yeah, I, th I think giving it the standards of what we do and putting our own touches, but keeping some classic pub dishes on, on there as well, yeah. Nice. Well, sounds amazing, looking forward to it. Um, other thing in the news that I just want to talk to you about, both of you, um, we put this on our Facebook and it, it's gone absolutely mad. And it was out of date chicken that someone tried to pass off as crab. And I don't know if you've seen this. Um, and they got fined for it. They've got into trouble for it. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, it's gone viral. It's gone mad. Um, but what I wanted to know is, have you ever tried to pass the food off as something it's not? I mean, Aaron, I know the answer to this question for you. <laughs> but, uh, 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 yeah. I've got a lot of um, I got yeah, I got a few. I got a few stories. A chef that I used to work for, he um, so basically it was like a galley kitchen, um, and the the EHO walked in. I think it was during lunch, and the uh, the maitre d' come running into the kitchen. He goes, oh, "EHO, he EHO, he goes, all right, just stall him for two minutes." He went into the fridge. And he had a load of like uh, lamb rumps, which were like on their way out. They were a little bit green. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he grabbed them and stuck them in his, uh, ran out the uh, back kitchen door, opened up his, um, his uh, box on the back of his motorbike, stuck them in there, went back in the kitchen. He's like, all right, we'll pass now. <laughs> wow. Wow. Green lamb chunks dripping in the back of your motorbike. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I think uh, I've never, me personally, I've never tried to, to pass anything off, but I have seen, um, a chef uh, ran out of scallops, so they got monkfish loin, cut it with a with a with a round cutter, and then oh, cooked that. them as scallops. I've seen that. <laughs> um, I think they're right, but I have one of the worst things I've ever seen in the kitchen. I mean, I've seen some horrific things in earlier stage of my career, 
Um, well, one of the worst ones was this, this guy from Liverpool and uh, the soup. Where I was working in a part, I was in a big hotel. I was working, it was called the Cotswold Arms. It was like a little pub, but within inside the, the Metropolitan Hotel, which is a big sort of hotel. Um, and the soup was really thin. And um, he said to me, it's a soup, Steve. Right? So I thought, okay, he's going to, we're thickening it. So we got a ladle of um, dirty uh, fryer oil, poured it into a bowl, poured the flour in, whisked it, and then whisked that into the soup. <laughs> and he said, I, I said to him, what's that? He said, it's called a scouse roux. That's what he called it. <laughs> The, 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 the chip fat, the oil was like black. So when the soup was being stirred, you could see like fragments of small burnt chips floating in top of the soup. Oh, do you wow. know what I mean? What do you call, what do you call them? Scouse croutons. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I've, I've, I've seen some, I've seen some, um, I've seen, I've seen a duck breast microwaved as it's away from raw. <laughs> Um, uh, I've seen I've seen some horrific things. I'd like to just point out, just for um, for legal reasons, none of these things happened here. Yes. <laughs> they happened, that very they clear. Happened, yeah, <laughs> they've happened. Right? I mean, I bet you the chefs out there that are watching this. I mean, that'd be a fantastic competition anyway to ask all of the chefs that, that and, and all the all the people in the industry to, to email in uh, or, or or maybe do it on Instagram. The worst culinary hack you've ever seen <laughs> amazing oh god <laughs> well i mean not, none of them i don't think was quite as bad as this i don't know if you've seen it but the picture of this chicken it's that's oh, god. Oh, yeah it's, it's disgusting revolt, i mean what yeah just and close, with, close those fuckers down the funny thing is isn't it uh you know that, there's that old saying when you taste them kevin goes what does that taste like it tastes like chicken so I could see the thought process of him trying to do that, but I mean to pass it off as crap. I mean Jesus Christ! I mean that's that's a, that's another level. That is that's another yeah. level. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, yeah. None of these things have happened in your restaurant, but thanks for sharing. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's go on to. So you've achieved so much, Glenn. Um, what else is on the list? Like, when do you get to a point where you're like, I've done everything now. I can just relax. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's going to be my relax. question. Boom. Oh, sorry, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think um, you know, the word relax doesn't really sort of enter the sort of the, 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 the chef world or even the hospitality world. I think, obviously, we've had, we've had this massive setback that's taken two years of, of, of what we're trying to do. Um, okay, we've got the pub opening, which is fantastic. I'm also looking at a, at, um, a tapas bar, which is opening round about April, but I just need to get that confirmation of that before we sort of went, we went out there with it. I think for me, it, it, you know, it, it's my job, which I don't think is a job, it, it's just the way of life. It is a way of life and I still do split shifts. I still enjoy doing service. I said to Luke when I came in, I'm really looking forward to tonight because I've had nearly three weeks off because of, you know, Christmas stuff. So I think just to be constantly moving forward as a restaurant uh, and one of my main focuses as, as I'm getting older is to give a little bit back to the industry as in training, as in trying to encourage younger people into the industry to try and make the industry more receptive and a little bit more diverse so we haven't got this old chef mentality of, of the way we run kitchens or the way front of house run front of house and I think that's a massive thing for me. I'm doing something with the local authorities to encourage young people into the hospitality industry, but it has to change dramatically for us to, 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 to and obviously you, obviously you know, because obviously you're dealing in, in, in staff and stuff, but mm. it has to change. We, we, we can't stay as we are, and we've been banging on about it for years, but I think it's a collective thing people need to do. But for me, that, that's my main focus in the next five years is to, is to keep developing Pernells to obviously get the pub up and flourishing. I've got a massive project, which is, uh, in Coventry as well, which has been put back and put back and put back. So it's just keeping focused and and and, and you know, <clears throat> and just carry on what we what we do and just focus on investing in some young people to to take on the baton and to eventually you know smash up Marlow and get a lift down from Chris Evans. I'd imagine that's probably really, not listening to this. That's probably what they want to do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've mentioned um, you've mentioned Luke a, a few times. Obviously, Luke. Luke Butcher, who works works for you. Um, how long has he been with you, and how important is it to have someone like that as your kind of right hand man? 
Yeah. I looked at this for 12 years. Yeah, I think it's 12 years. I said to him it's only 10 because you can't count the last two. He obviously gets upset about that because, I mean, as I mean, Aaron knows, Luke. Um, he gets upset at anything. <laughs> he gets, he's just generally upset, isn't he? He's just... <laughs> he, and Tom always calls him, why oh, are you so grumpy? That's generally what Tom always says. Um, exactly like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's really important. I mean, I, I'm, I've been... People say that I'm lucky that I've, uh, I've had people that have been with me for a long time, but I don't think it's luck. I think it's, you know, the environment that I... I put there but it's also the environment they create so it's really important if, if, if we want to do other projects and we want to keep ourselves in the sort of the media to, to push the product we have to have solid people that are there I mean I'm here 99% of the time but if you know I've got three children as well so if things pop up that I have to pop out and do then I've got the likes of Luke but then that works on the other side for Luke Luke has got a young family and you know, like if he if he has to, if he's got something to do on the weekend, that you know, and I'll make sure that I'm here to support him. So it's really important, and that's investing in staff, and that's looking after the people that look after you. And I think a lot of um, owners that maybe not chefs, but actually owners should look at that and look at the loyalty what the staff show, and you should reciprocate that. You know, so yeah, it's really important that we've got solid people, especially for that consistent level that we're trying to achieve. Definitely. Um, I like to have a, a bit of a Google before we get people on. Um, mm. And I did like this quote from the Birmingham Post that was that you're undoubtedly the finest chef to hail from Chelmsley Wood. <laughs> Which I felt yeah. like, is, there, is there a big pot of you from Chelmsley Wood? <laughs> no, no, no. Basically, it just made I, me giggle. <laughs> it, well, it, it sort of makes me laugh because I think they're trying to be, I think they're taking a piss a bit there, to be honest with you. Now, let me just tell you about Chelmsley Wood. Chelmsley Wood um, <clears throat> was a cancer state in Europe in the sort of mid. The mid, sort of mid to late 70s so it's the biggest cancer estate so uh, it is um, it's a rough and ready estate I mean there's some fantastic people in Charmsley Wood I've still got family that live on there but to, to say that I think he's a little bit taking take a bit of a ribbon which I find quite endearing because I love the facts of where I'm from and you know it was a tough upbringing and it's a tough area to sort of to come from and leaving school with no real qualifications just a hard working ethic is, is the reason why I'm sitting here talking to you today so it's yeah I love the place um but if you tell me, if you ask many people from Solihull which is the posh side so Charmswood is the dark side of Solihull so Solihull is one of the nicest places to live in the country apparently and uh Charmswood is just stuck to the side of it like some sort of little rash um <laughs> which I, I, I love to be part of the rash so yes I, I'm, I'm more than happy to be to be named uh, the best chef that's hailed from the biggest shit hole in the Midlands yeah I am yeah <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Just love that that was the top top quote yeah. on, yeah. when you Google. <laughs> um, you obviously you've you've written books and you've written children's books as well. Yeah. Um, firstly, like what is it about doing that that you that you enjoy and why did you kind of go down the children book kind of route? Um, well, I'd be blatantly honest with you. I did a lot of drugs in the 90s, if I'd be honest, okay? Um, so my imagination, I mean, it was, it, was, it was radical before all that and obviously with a couple of flashbacks and obviously having children myself. I love, um, I love, I love, I mean, the best time of your life, apart from rolling around the floor with Chris Evans in Marlowe, the best time in your life is, is when you're a kid, you know? So everything when you're a kid... Is, is exciting, everything is, you're in a safe place, aren't you, 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 you know, you, you, you get fed, you get watered, but the excitement for everything is massive, and I, I love to still feel like I'm a kid sometimes, so, so writing books is just, it's just to fulfill, fulfill myself, it isn't got anything to do with trying to make money, it's not any, anything to do with that, it's, if I set out and I want to do something, I do it, so, I mean, I've, you know, I come up with loads of crazy sort of little stories all the time, and I used to make up the stories with my kids and they say oh dad dad tell us that story about such and such well that time I've forgotten that story because that was two nights ago and I made it up as we sat around um and I, I just find it satisfying to to do stuff that isn't fully about the industry but I still got that massive creative edge which I love I mean I, I used to oil paint a fair bit as well um and if I'm not doing something creative like that I do get a little bit 
frustrating, a little bit down, actually. I feel a little bit sort of low if I don't do um, something that can focus my sort of rushing sort of thought process. So that, that's, that's the reason I do it. It's self-fulfillment of, of that. And also, I go to lots of schools and I sort of basically just give the books away, to honest with you, because I just think it's really a nice thing to do. Uh, the first one I wrote was for my for my kids. Was about the dog that eats baked beans, curry powder, and farts, um, which was quite a popular book because uh, every kid loves farts, don't they? I mean, no, I don't <laughs> do um, you know, because the dog always gets blamed anyway. So you may you may as well, whatever. But I did that because my daughter. The, the, uh, I had whoops before I had the children, and, and obviously when the children arrived, she was like um, getting. On a bit, and she walked past this little fat Jack Russell, all grey, like a barrel on legs. And my daughter said, oh, Dad, his whoop's gonna die. And she was only about five or six. And I was like, uh, Not for a while, Princess. And I thought, All right, I'm gonna immortalize the dog. So I wrote the story for the children to immortalize their first pet. So, and they're in the book, there's a little picture of the illustrators done in the book and stuff. So, yeah, and it was about that. And then the second one was just, again, just, just a flashback from our day for 97. So yeah, it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's basically self-fulfillment for, uh, to express really. And, and it just makes me chuckle to myself. And, and I love to see kids when I have the book and they're at the restaurants, they're up for sale, but I generally, if a young child comes into the restaurant, they, 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 they can they can have as many as I want. So. Yeah, that, that's the reason why I've done it. So if you could pick a, a chef in the industry now that you could turn into a children's book character, who would you, who would you pick? Oh, well, that's easy, isn't it? I mean, Claude is probably the most comical person. Uh, <laughs> but, like, because he's French as well. And, he, 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 you know, if you was to draw... Uh, I, I did a painting for Claude, and it was in his restaurant for a while. And obviously, I spent a bit of time with him, and he's got, he's got a great sense of humour. But then he flips quite quickly. And you know when you see a cartoon when uh, someone's uh, someone's uh, gets angry and they and, and they go bright red and steam comes out their ears. It's that comical effect that isn't funny when you're on the other side of it. But if you're watching from the other side of the kitchen, it's hilarious. So I think I think Claude would be a great one. You'd like having with you know because he's a French chef and and all the rest of it. I think he would be he, he would be a great character in a book, definitely. <laughs> I want to see this book. <laughs> I want to write one, actually. I don't know what I'm going to call it. Um, but, yeah, I think there's something there. There's something there. But what I'd say, like, a phenomenal chef, but what a great sense of humour and mm. so tenacious but so uh, expressive and so emotionally driven about what he does. I think that's what would make him, all the great qualities he's got would make him to be a fantastic character in, in a book. <laughs> Aaron, is there something you can relate to, that kind of, creative outlets that you that you need to keep keep yourself going for me when I was you know when I was cooking I mean uh, I it was I wasn't necessarily driven by the creativity um when I got to the hand I was like and, and when I got put into you know a position of authority like sous chef head chef um it was a case of right we're doing 1300 covers a week over seven days you need to make sure that this is bang on every single time at a, you know a two-star standard and that's and that you know whether that's a you know smoked out of common it, it almost became like a production line so it was managing that it wasn't necessary um because and also because guests weren't coming that we didn't have regulars anymore because you were booking a year in advance like so everyone coming had it was the first time at the Hand of Flowers and they weren't coming two, three, four times a year. So the, from, from a creativity point of view, it, what, it, it wasn't necessarily super creative. There was, you know, things that were moving and changing tweaks to uh, seasonal tweaks, uh, whether it was, you know, a, a, a different fish or a different vegetable, et cetera, et cetera. But it was more so of like, I am the captain of making sure everything is bang on. And that was... And that's what drove me rather than the create the creative side outside of work. I like to try and, you know, grab a musical instrument and give it a go. But I'm yeah, other than other than that, with regards to when I was when I was cooking, when I was working up, up the road, it, it was it wasn't I wasn't driven by the creative side of things. I was driven to make sure everything was bang on every single time. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I, th I think I think in the kitchen, it, it, like like a football team, that is just as important 
to have that control and the logistic side of it and the discipline to get exactly what needs to be done. I mean, Luke, he, he, he's, that's one of his strengths, actually. I mean, Luke is obviously a creative guy as well. He's a pastry chef, so, you know, it's a little bit light on the loafers, but which is which is fine. But he he is very similar to the fact that he'll, he'll once something is in place, it stays in place and it's that consistency, which is so important in the kitchen. So although the creative side probably gets more of the, the recognition, the recognition of someone that can run the kitchen with that discipline and that consistency is equally as important. So most definitely get exactly where you're coming from there. You both fish though, right? Don't you? You both both fish. Is that something you do outside of outside the restaurant? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so yeah. do, do you course fish or do you, do you fly fish? Um, yeah, uh, lakes, yeah, course fishing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I fly fish. I course fish from the age of about six. I mean, them days, you'd, you'd have to give you a fishing rod, never mind health and safety. Just go down the river. You can't swim that well, but you'd be fine if you catch a fish. So um, so I course fish right up until sort of about six years ago. And um, I've lived out in the sticks for about, about 12 years now, it's about 10 miles just outside, outside of Birmingham. Uh, and I took up fly fishing because I went to the local pub and there was quite a few people doing. I've recently taken, well, recently, last three or four years I've done a bit of shooting as well so I do like the um the country sort of sports and the leisure size yeah well fishing is a great great way of relaxing and taking yourself out of the stress of what oh. the industry can offer really I think mm. yeah just sit yeah sitting on the bank with like just this like no nothing just nothing just you your rods <laughs> the, the yeah. lake and and that's it and Oh uh, yeah, it's, be- it's 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 the best. I can't think of a better way to relax. Although when you haven't caught a fish for a couple of days, then you start to get a little bit tense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I know. I know the- <laughs> get back in the kitchen and take it out of somebody else. Um, <laughs> I think. I mean, there's a few chefs that are uh, that are fishermen, and obviously I know you do. But I mean, Daniel's a massive fisherman. Daniel is, and, and, mm-hmm. and he he goes by the. I mean, he goes all over the world, Daniel, to, to, to fish and stuff. So, and he's obviously a great angler. So, I think it's something. I mean, I'm not a golfer, to be honest with you. Um, I find. I mean, a lot. I know a lot of chefs play golf. But I've never really got the angle of it. I either have to do absolutely nothing and relax, or something explosive. So I box and I do uh, contact uh, sort of fighting, which I've done since I've been in my um, in, in my teens. So that's a, just another avenue of what I do. So I, I normally, I go to um, a train at a pro gym at the moment, which is the east side, which is by the Birmingham City Ground. Um, so I do that, that's my other side. So I go fishing and shooting, and then I do the explosive stuff, which keeps me sort of fit, but also keeps that tenacity to, to, to a level that it doesn't spill over anywhere else, man. But that's, what, that's, that's generally, I think, really important though. And I say this to all chefs, uh, all front of the base, but all chefs, to look at something you can do on your days off. Don't stay in bed. I know you're tired. Don't stay in bed. Get some fresh air. Do something. Okay, we all like a little bit of a drink and stuff, but do something that can keep your focus on the balance of, of the lifestyle of what a chef is. And I feel that my fishing and my, you know, my boxing and the rest of it really does that for me. And fishing is a great one. And, and, and you know, Going yeah. down to football isn't so great because we're awful, but that, that's what I tend to do. And I think you think it's important, Aaron, that you should you should you should um, encourage younger chefs to try and take up something like that. A hundred percent. Like we mentioned it, I think on a um, on on a previous podcast of like having a focus outside of work, having something that you can just completely switch off from you know fr- from your day to day you know your day to day job, and 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 it's yeah. so important for you know for mental health and 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 just to just so you can relax and just forget do you know what I mean and have that have that something that you're you know it doesn't have to be something that you're super super passionate about you don't have to go you know full OCD and you know all the gear no idea just something you can do to get away from yeah whether it's like you say you can go and play top golf and smash some balls around with your mates have a few drinks do you know what I mean like or just go play a bit of -of five-a-side football I mean I know that was we tried doing, <laughs> we, we tried doing um, so after service on a Sunday. Um, back, this was back way back when. Um, in the summer, we used to go and have a kickabout, and it lasted for one week because um, I nearly broke Lourdes's leg. <laughs> she came <laughs> in the next day, couldn't walk, and Tom lost his shit. He's like, "No more football! No more football!" 
<laughs> we, used to, we used to play against other restaurant Swedes um, years ago. And um, obviously, I, I mean, I play football for, for, since I've been a kid and stuff. So I'm, my passion does overspill when I, when I play sports and stuff. And uh, it basically a couple of times turned into like a, a 15 man brawl. So we had to, I had to rein in it as well. And, and some of the tackles were flying in, yeah. but like they were flying in against each other. And I was like, you can't, you can't break, <laughs> you can't break the larder chef's legs because we need him <laughs> the rest of the week. So yeah, it's it's about having that control and just doing something you enjoy doing. Like mm. you said, you don't have to be great at it and you don't have to go full on, mm. but certainly try to have that different avenue to whatever. I mean, I ain't being funny, but maybe just read a good book. That's probably better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Less hazardous. <laughs> yeah. so i like the idea of inter restaurant football you could do could you transfer that over to your fighting as well glenn is that is there chefs that you would like to to get in, in the ring i am i uh i know Mar marcus marcus is a is, is a great boxer marcus box for, for for a long time as an amateur with his, with his brother as well and um He's, he, when we first got to know each other, I, you know, I got a lot of time for Mark because he's, he's, he's actually quite a funny guy. He's a little bit intense when you first meet him, but he's actually he's, he's actually a really nice guy. Um, and he's all every time he every time he used to see me, he used to say to me, you know, when we're going to have this, when we're going to have this boxing match, he's bobbing and weaving and all the rest of it, which that's never happened. Um, I don't really want him to get punched in the face by Marcus, but I mean, obviously, I would send him one strike back. But um, yeah, and the other one, the other one who who's really really. Um, Focused on that, he's uh, Gary Jones from the Manga. Uh, and again, I've got a lot of time for Gary. I think you know, again, like yourself, he's he's run that he's run that kitchen like the tightest ship ever for such a long time, and he's one of the industry's absolute legends. And I went for a job there as a sous chef for uh, I think it was a, I, I took the job at Claude's rather than the Manga, and that was just because of the size of the kitchen. But he loves his martial arts. He's basically dangerous, this guy is. But he's such a lovely guy. But every time I see him, I seen him last time I saw him was at the I was at the Michelin event, uh, and we almost had like a little wrestle in in, in the toilet. Um, <laughs> we were walking because he sees me and he and he pulls all these moves out and stuff. So yeah, uh, I don't think I'd like to take Gary Jones on. Well, I did a little bit in the toilets, but we had a couple of drinks. But yeah, um, that, that could be one. Could be. A, I mean, I think there was one years ago. I think um, Fred from uh, yeah, First Fred Three X did it, didn't he? Like yeah, charity he, boxing. He, yeah, I, yeah he, he carries it on as well, doesn't he? he um, yeah, he's a, he's a good boxer. Yeah, so yeah. it could be something there. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah. Be good. Yeah, definitely worth a watch. I think you'd raise some good money. <laughs> I'll, I'll be, I'll be the ring announcer. I'll be, I'll be the next Michael Buffer. <laughs> or, or because obviously you're so young and good looking, you could wear like some really tight shorts and just, and just. I could be the ring girl. That's you it. Could be the, or no, sorry, the ring person. Ring person. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> You can add that to your CV, Aaron. I will. <laughs> um, obviously, we've talked about um, Great British Menu, Glenn, and, and, and you know you, you have done done that that program. Um, is it something you still watch now? Is it something you still champion now? Um, or has everything changed so much from uh, obviously when you first first did it? Uh, I think it has changed a lot since I first did it. Um, I mean, I really enjoyed it. Um, I got the pleasure of cooking again, sat in the one 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 year and I got cook against Daniel and the other one. So never had the easiest path to, to, to the banquet. But uh, I don't I don't really watch it now, possibly because it's just time. But if it does come on and I hear that iconic uh, um, theme tune in the background, I'll definitely flick it on and I give it that 10, 15 minutes if I've got it. Uh, I think a few of the guys in the kitchen watch it. I think it's I think it's a phenomenal show uh, and it was a real sort of platform for, for Pernals. Um, it exploded when we did it in the third series and, and the fourth with, with the, the, the creme brulee egg and, and, and the, the monkfish. But I think definitely it's something that young chefs, you know, should do but what I, what I always think is sometimes is if you do it too early in your career it can put a lot of pressure on you 
after the show because you know the expectation is there but i think it's a phenomenal uh, format and i think it's great to, to to get your face out there so especially if you've got your own restaurants or you're trying to sort of get a bit more recognition to, to, to get yourself out, out there i mean it's it's, it's a great program and uh, do you enjoy doing tv uh, yeah, I, I, you know what? I just see it as a bit of a as, a as a cherry on top, really. I mean, I love running my restaurant. I love you know the interaction with my staff and the rest of it. But the TV for me is fun, and I think you know when you stop having fun with something, you stop doing it. I mean, you know, I've I haven't I've done a fair bit over over the last. I did Master Chef, the professionals, which was great. Which again is another great show. And I, I filmed uh, Master Chef, the the amateurs one, and that comes out in March and. That was fun. I had to I had to add six people, two had to do the starters, two had to do the main course, two had to do the dessert for this for this banquet that we had to do um, for about 40, 50 people. And none of them had been in a professional kitchen before. So they, I showed them the dish uh, about two hours, three hours before them serving it. So the pressure of that was great, but it was extremely good fun. So TV for me... Um, it's just fun, really. I, I, I like to enjoy myself when I do it, and I don't put that much pressure on myself to have to perform. I just be myself all of the time, and I always stick to that. I'm always exactly the same. Yeah. Well, you you tell me. I mean, I generally am always <laughs> like this, which is a fucking nightmare sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> 12 years he's had of that, Luke. 12 years. <laughs> 12 years. No wonder he's always grumpy, eh? Fucking hell, yeah. You think, you think hanging out with me for 12 years, you'd cheer up a bit, wouldn't you? <laughs> um, we've also mentioned um, uh, Michelin as, as well, and obviously you're getting a Michelin star. What are your thoughts on Michelin, Glenn, this year? Do you think the industry is completely... I mean, the two years that we, obviously that we've had, do you think it's changed? And like, we have seen a lot of chefs change direction as well because of, you know, the change in like work-life balance and everything like that. So what are your thoughts on Michelin? Is there anyone that you're thinking, yep, yeah, they're, they're definitely going to be in that in that guide that we don't know already? I mean, Michelin is, is a phenomenal um, institution. It's, it's been around for a very long time. It, you know, it celebrates... Um, the, obviously the positive side of it it celebrates the great of the industry um, it can obviously have a reverse effect if, if things don't go well for you that year and you, you, you lose something or, you, or you're sort of, de 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 sort of demoted down which can obviously be detriment to your business which you know can cause a lot of stress and cause financial whatever so it's, it's the good and the bad side of it um, you know I think it's I think it's important that it's around, but is it that important that you jeopardise your business? So I think the key thing is, and I think Michelin would say that as well, I mean, the most important thing about running any form of restaurant or eatery is to pay the bills, pay the staff, and make a good living out of it and enjoy that process. Uh, if Michelin are there for that positive side of it, then, then, then great. I mean, I haven't eaten out much uh, over the last sort of um, two years because I've been either – Everything's been short when I've been extremely busy myself. So it'd be difficult for me to pinpoint a, a restaurant. I mean, the last time I ate at one of the last times I ate at the at the Ritz, I mean John Williams and his team are phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, and they really show how a professional, serious professional team works. I wouldn't be surprised if that didn't go up to two um, because of the food I there. I thought, I thought it was it was it was pretty faultless. And again, John, I've got so much time and respect for him and you know, um, I entered the uh, annual order of excellence when I was 20 and he was the chair of the academy uh, at the time. And, you know, throughout that, throughout that process of the competition, he really supported and tried to help as well as judge you in a strict manner. So I think that for me would be one to look out for as in to, to go up. Uh, there's a couple of places in Birmingham that, that, that might have a chance. Um, You've got Cray Treadwell, who, um, who worked for me for nearly four years. You've got Folium over the back, Ben. Uh, you've got the guys at the wilderness. So there's a couple of there's a couple of places close to me that I think maybe could could go up. So I mean, and good luck to anyone that that, that has got aspirations to to want to get into the guide at that serious level. And, and you know, but it isn't the end of the world. Um, and I, I think after this pandemic, or while we're still in the pandemic, it's important that we keep our focus on 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 the standards we want to do, but also to make a living and to stay afloat and to keep staff into work. I think that should be the first focus 
before we start thinking about accolades. And if accolades come and you know notoriety comes with that, then 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 so be it. So I think it's important, but I think at this current time it's survival and staying focused and keeping your restaurants and your bars and, and whatever open really. Yeah. Aaron, yeah. how do you feel about Michelin now you're kind of looking in rather than worrying about about I mean, keeping those accolades? <laughs> Yeah, uh, for me, like squeaky bum time, whether that was October or or January or whenever you know, whenever it came around, it was. I shit. I used to shit myself. I like, <laughs> like it was. Yeah, it. But I th- you you knew deep down that it was okay, but there was you know that you never knew until you opened up that book or the you know or you went to the went to the events. And now that. You know, I'm I'm away from that. It's it, I can take a you know a deep breath, but you still feel you still get a bit anxious. You know, when when that guy comes out for the you know for the people that you know I you know, I still know in the industry. I think you know it's an incredible, like like Lynn said, it's an institution. It's you know it's been going for donkey's years. It shows consistency across the board, um, and it's something that you know is can, can you know can can take your business from you know from here up to there but at the same yeah. time it's not the, like Glenn said it's not the be all and end all and especially you know over the last two years that we face in the industry I think especially for the younger chefs out there as well who are gunning for that you know first star or second star I think it's just you're still open you're still making money your staff are still getting paid like that is yeah. that is that's paramount right now and you know everything else that comes Afterwards is, you know, it's just a bonus, I think, for, for where the, you know, the industry, you know, finds itself at the moment. Most definitely. And, and I'm just like echo what you're saying. It's, 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 it's about just focusing on staying open. And, and I'm sure, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, over more than convinced that we are going to have the good times again. And it's about just really knuckling down and keep going on. Uh, and then if Michelin, you know, Michelin support the industry as much as they can and and shine the light on the people that need it shining as well. I think I think it's really important. So yeah, so I think you know here's to a good 2022 and and if you know when the guide comes out and I hope you know fingers crossed for everybody that you, we go up and, and and stay solid in the guide. So yeah, one of the things that I remember Glenn saying and he's now he's got it slapped across the, the extraction in his kitchen. I think it's on the like the canopy. It's um. And, and something that's that's you like Glynn's cooking, Tom's you know Tom's cooking, Sats cooking. They they it, it's all about their personality and it's all about what they believe in. And, and one thing that you know this this quote that he's got in his kitchen is to be the fashion is not to be the fashion. And that yeah. like so like and, and Glynn can explain it a lot better than I can. But it's just so important not to be like swayed and swerved by food trends and uh, and and gimmicks but especially for young cooks out there like instagram is is you know can be a bit of a pain in the ass for young chefs because you you know you you look at you look at this place you look at that place and you go i want to work there because that dish looks amazing but you have no idea what that restaurant's about you have no idea what you know and 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 so many young chefs go i want to do this i want to i want to you know, I want to do molecular gastronomy. I want to cook like uh, Rene Redzepi. I want to like it's. A, you need to be able to rein it in and just understand like what food actually is. Yeah. So, Glyn, just explain. I think I think um, it, for me as well. I mean, you know, I, I like to think there isn't there isn't another Glyn Panel out there. I like to think that I'm quite unique. Like we all are unique, you know. And um, I think one of the one of the one of the, the one of the things that really, really, right, uh, really hit home for me is um, I worked uh, with Claude. Claude had a very unique style. Um, and then when I left Claude's, I opened Jessica's. And I, I opened Jessica's in a very, very short time, straight after opening, uh, leaving Claude's. And he rang me up about two weeks after opening. And he said to me, he said, Glee, he said, I'd love to come and eat at Jessica's he said but I don't see there's any point because I can just eat my own food and I thought fucking hell I looked at I I took a second to look at what I was doing 
And basically, it was it, for the first couple of weeks, I was almost just cooking exactly the trying to cook the same food as Claude's. And he said to me, you know, you can go to bed thinking you're Alan, Alan Ducasse, but when you wake up in the morning, you'll just be glimping out. So that for me, that conversation I had with him, which was really awkward, and, and I, you know, and I thank him for being brutally honest with me, completely hit me. And I was like, well, you know what? All I'm going to be, I'm going to try and be just going to keep being a better glimper now. That's what I'm going to be. I don't want to try and replicate anyone else doing. So I, I really focused on that. And I, and I think then it sort of, then it sort of, you know, the clientele were coming through and they were saying, wow, we've never had nothing like this before. This is so different, unique. And I just think it's important that you try to cook what you love to cook. And like you said, Aaron, don't, you know, jump in and just look at Instagram and replicate stuff. I mean, take inspiration from other people's food, take inspiration from certain presentation and techniques, but develop your own cooking uh, style, but li also listen to your customers as well, you know. So it's no good one minute you've got a uh, uh, hot pot on and the next minute you're trying to sort of sous vide uh, something at the lowest temperature to try to change it. Grab hold of your style and just develop that. And that has always been for me. To be the fashion is not to be the fashion. So I'm the sort of guy, if I walked out onto a street and everyone was running left, I'd probably start running right. I, whether I bump into a tiger, I don't know. But that's a sort of mentality I'd have. But yeah, and it's something I, I encourage the lads because, I mean, it isn't just me that puts the food on the pass. I mean, you, you know, I've got some great chefs in the kitchen that will put some in calm. I think, and I'll say to them, where did you get that from? And if they say, well, I've seen some in calm, you know, Instagram, I'll say to them, well, have a re look at it. And then, you know, taste it and then try and bring it to the style of food we're doing. So, yeah, it's, it's always a battle with young chefs because they do need inspiration and they do need guidance. But what they can't do is fall into that trap of buying the newest book and just replicating that because it's just it's painting by numbers. Do you know what I mean? So look at look at the classic flavours, look at what works for you and, and just develop your own style. And we've always believed that to be the fashion. is not. To be, I've actually got it tattooed on my back as well. I mean, I'd say I'd, I'd show you, but it'd probably take me about 10 minutes to get this uh, beautiful hoodie off. To, to <laughs> There'll be a lot of static. Eh? Oh, got a small fire, especially on my chest. It would spark up a Magnum PI fire off my hairy <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get to, to Glenn stripping, I think that's a, a, a great place to finish grilled. <laughs> um, uh, thank you so much, Glenn. Like, I've really, really enjoyed it. I'm, and I'm now looking forward to a, a, a Claude inspired children's book and a charity oh, fight between you and, and Marcus. <laughs> but yeah. I mean yeah, that's, it sounds like a very fulfilling 2022, if only if those two things happen, you know? Yes, absolutely. But yeah, thank you, Glenn. Thank you so much. Um, Aaron, a pleasure thank as you. always. We've got one left, haven't we? We've got, um, got uh, Paul Foster is our last one. So I look forward yeah. to seeing you for the next episode. Uh, Glenn, thanks. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very you much. Should. Cheers, mate. Look, See you later. Thanks.